Sadashiva Samarambam Shankara Sharya Madhyamam Asmada Sharya Pariyantam Bande Guru Param Param Ishwaro Gurat Meti Muti Veda Vibhagine Vyomavda Vyapta Deaya Dakshinamurta Yenamaha Sava Vedanta Sedanta Gocharam Tamagocharam Govindam Paramanandam Sachi Guru Pranatosh Maham Om Shanti 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 Om Namaste Page Page 194, at the very end of that uh, verse of 39. Uh, the verse 39 says that, uh, talks about the yoga of detachment. The yoga of detachment is indeed difficult to be comprehended by all yogis. Yogis are afraid of this yoga because they see fear in the fearless Brahman. Okay. So, Swamiji has done a beautiful introduction of his, this class here. Huh? What's going on here? Okay. It's always difficult when I'm away from my setup. So he was saying that uh, there is only Brahman and uh, people have a difficult to to see uh, to see that there is no harm, there is no need to be concerned or excited about what's happening around us because uh, it's all Brahman. Uh? And people do have difficulty. Uh, due to this lack of self-knowledge, lack of uh, Vedantic vision that all there is is Brahman. Just a sec, there is something bothering me here, doing to do to do it's just miles here. Let me change. Okay, that will be bad. And then he was talking about uh, they do not have this knowledge. No? They take themselves to be the three bodies and the three worlds. They feel very insecure in a world in which everything is not under one's control. They feel limited by time and space. They hate the fact that time is consuming the physical body. And when they are insecure, they, they begin to try to hold on to some thing or other for security. So all our relationships are attempt, attempts to find security. But as we know, everybody is insecure. When you get two people insecure and you get... Uh, you don't get too insecurity plus insecurity brings about uh, security, you know, brings about according to Swamiji, even double insecurity. It brings about insecurity plus you know, attachment, which is a big thing, you know, to be attached. It's, uh, it's a very vulnerable place to be. So, and the point here Swamiji is making is how does uh, one handle this uh, insecurity and the uh, tendency of finding insecurity security in a world, in an insecure world, in meaning to say, uh, not under our control. Huh? And then there is only one way we need to transfer our uh, dependence 
from the world to Ishwara and then from Ishwara to myself and then uh, self uh, dependence is independence. Independence is what we say to be moksha. You know? This is what Vedanta uh, offers. And uh, it's clear to all of us that the cause of insecurity is uh, ignorance in respect to the fact that everything is just I, myself, Brahman, consciousness, to be howsoever we want to show, to say. Uh, I am to be one without a second. I don't hold on to anything because I'm the only thing in Tao. I'm the only truth. I'm the only reality, one without a second. So how can I hold on to something? You see, the nature of consciousness, the nature of Brahman, our true nature, can only be one without a second. Otherwise, there would be no uh, security. There would be no... Uh, Moksha, no? if there would be anything other than only I conscious existence, no? and then mm, this second element besides myself would uh, create a sort of a relationship. And when you see, you start being tangled with relationship. Relationship is an amazing thing to, to bring about entanglement and, and trouble and uh, some level of conflict and, and so on, huh? insecurity. So the only way is not to remember our true nature as a sangha, free from association, uh, free from dependence. And then, uh, <clears throat> and then we are good. We are absolutely aligned or in harmony with our nature as one without a second. I am conscious that there is only consciousness Therefore, there is nothing I can really relate or associate to. All associations, they appear in my, in this apparent order in which my appearance, Jiva Atma, interacts with uh, people, places, and things. Huh? But in truth, I myself, I never associate with anything because there is only me. Oh, but this is so lonely. You cannot interact, associate, and have a relationships. No, you cannot. Or you can say, no, I'm going to relate to myself and myself alone. Or in my case, I just decide to relate to my chickens. And now I have a dog as well. It's less trouble to, to relate to, to pets and chickens. Not knowing that... Uh, there is only myself. I see duality. I report duality as reality. And I get afraid and insecure. I do not need support because uh, I am the support for the entire universe. I am the support for my Vishwa, my Taijaza, and my Pranya, and all these realms and Lokas and universe. So to understand this, a lot of maturity, preparedness, is required for the majority of people advaita which is in fact the, the true source of security the only source of security appears to be the most insecure thing what i'm not i'm not going to have anything to lean to you know and then people run away from advaita vedanta of course as we know look at us here the three of us the four of us Immature seekers are afraid of Advaitam because they see insecurity in Advaitam. Remember, we should move from world dependence to God dependence to self dependence. Surukam Yoga, Yani Yoga, and, and uh, Nididhyasana. For a Kami Yogi, God is the support and not the family. So for a samsari, the family and friends are the support for a samsari. For a religious person who became a sannyas, God and God, only God is the support. The, fam the family life for the kamiyog serves the purpose of purifying one's mind and by growing spiritually. In the Gita, Krishna says, those people who see themselves as no separate from me, recognize me 
and gain me. For those who are always one with me, I take care of what they want to acquire and to keep and protect. This is a very nice uh, verse uh, further on the chapter 9. When Krishna says, and I represent Ishwara, that for those people who transferred their dependence from the world to myself, the, the creator, Ishwara, you know, and for those who have seen that uh, I'm not, my nature and their nature are ident identical, you know, they recognize our identical nature, therefore, it is as if they finally have gained me. Nobody has gained anything except people has gained, have gained the removal of a misconception uh, that uh, I need to do yoga to connect back to God or my true nature or the source of uh, security and freedom and so on. And then for those people who gain this knowledge, for those who are always with me, don't worry, I will take care of what you need to acquire and to keep, protect. So I often remember and I often mention when I see this verse, a friend of mine here from Brazil that uh, at certain point he told me, having a lot of problems, he was so obsessed with Vedanta and his wife with children, a lot of karma going on, and he was spending all the time in the Vedanta, 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 you know, a, a web page and uh, sharing the knowledge and so on. He was very enthusiastic. And, uh, and then I went to Sao Paulo, I stayed a few days in their home, in their apartment there, and then he, he called me and said, Naga, so when is Ishwara going to take care of, of business here? Because, uh, you know, I'm doing all this Vedanta stud and sharing and so on, and uh, this is my passion, this is what I want, but you know I have these bills, I have so many uh, worldly uh, duties and, and things to deal with. So when is Ishwara going to take care of all these things, you know? So what do you say? What would you say if somebody approached you that way? No? I would say when you completely and absolutely surrender. Yeah, many things can be said. Huh? Well said, uh, Mark. Yeah. yeah, fundamentally, as to understand your your identical nature in as uh, such as Ishvara Atma and Paramatma, so you relax, and then uh, and then things are going to unfold with uh, a different attitude, so that uh, you take things as prasada. Uh, all is good, as James used to say. It's good when it's good, and it's good when it's not good. So you're protect. Why? Because uh, you have uh, resolved your mind by knowledge, you know. So once you get your mind resolved, and then the adversities and challenges that we find in the world do not affect us yeah, as they do affect the samsari. So as if Krishna is taking care of everything for us, and it's taking care because uh, I have brought my mind to the teachings that reveals my true nature as identical to the nature of Lord Krishna. So Krishna is the source, the source of security and peace, so therefore the same with me. So I have worked on the fundamental level of the problem, which is my mind. My mind is okay, and my mind being okay, I accept my karma and uh, accept my roles. I do what I need to do offering my actions with attitude of reverence and uh, and and the contribution now yeah? adding something to the field i see the field as Shwar. so there are many things that can be said to explain why krishna says that i will take care of everything for you and then some people say no in, in fact there is something uh, mystical that uh, 
that does happen that uh, since I became a devotee of the Lord, since I became, you know, uh, a newborn Christian or something like that, you know, my life is being taken care. Jesus or God or Krishna is taking care of my life. So is there something to that? So uh, I don't know, but maybe, maybe there is something, you know. God takes a sympathy to those devotees that somehow recognize him as the creator, the sustainer, and the recycler of everything, you know. You never know. Huh? Indian yoga. Father, in Indian yoga, one learns that the real God is not Krishna's uh, body form. It's my true nature as Atma. Turiya Atma is the true God. The Yan Yogi knows that God is none other than the self. Thus, Yan Yogi goes from God dependence to self dependence, better say to moksha. Moksha is my pre and independent nature, independent of what? Of the body mind and the world experienced by the body mind. But most people find the world dependence or God dependence comfortable. They remain there, afraid of going for the binary yin yoga proposed by the Upanishads. Now, have you ever seen a, a baby bird uh, getting ready to fly? You know, it has been under the, the wings of mommy, you know, getting everything provided and so on, and then money, oh, it's enough. You need to fly on your own. Huh? And then there is a little fear. So you have to let go of the wings of Lord Krishna or Ishwara or God, you know, and, uh, and, and just accept that you are the very same source of security and freedom. Uh, verse 40, fearlessness, cessation of grief, self-knowledge, and everlasting peace. All this is dependent on the discipline of the mind for all these yogs. So he's saying that uh, not only self-knowledge and the peace derived, self-knowledge, which is knowledge, the experience of everlasting peace the experience of cessation of grief, the experience of absence of desires and fears. So all of this, you know, depends on what? Depends on mental discipline, mental qualification, mental education, mental uh, refinement and purification. So all the preparation must be there. So all yogs must know that you need to, to be uh, properly prepared to get self-knowledge and then enjoy the fruits, which is everlasting peace, uh, lack of fear, no suffering or grief. Uh, but for that, we need what? We need a, a prepared mind. So... So there is a yoga, he's going to, to emphasize here the need for upasana before we get to nididhyasana even, you know, because uh, karma yoga is going to do the job to a certain degree. But then uh, if you want to have a, a real disciplined mind, he's talking, he's going to be talking more and more of discipline of the mind, discipline of thoughts, which is the most difficult, as we know. The, the third D of the, of the Vedantic qualifications is the discipline D, né? dispassion, discrimination, dispassion, and discipline. Disciplines uh, begins with disciplines of the sense instruments, the sense organs, uh, discipline of the organs of action, discipline of the words or, or the tongue and the, the words that come, you know, uh, discipline of the actions you do, né? and so all of this is a grosser level of discipline, and we should always begin uh, at that level, yeah, observing. And the, the most subtle is the discipline of thoughts or discipline of mind. 
né? watch and see and vigilantly watching the tendency of the mind in terms of uh, attitudes, words, and deeds. Né? And uh, before a certain thought produce a certain word and a certain action, so we need to be sure that uh, that thought is in harmony with uh, your educational process, uh, Vedantic, Upanishadic educational process, in which you understand <clears throat> that uh, there is no need to be uh, afraid or concerned because uh, there is only you. Uh, there is only you consciousness and you are free and independent from the superimposition of Nama Rupas. So you have to go through this process to an extent and uh, <clears throat> until that knowledge is somehow uh, fixable in your mind so that it works for you. But what happens here is that we get this knowledge most of the time before we have a, a disciplined mind, a pure mind, or, or, or you know, a vigilant mind, you know, a control of the mind, control of the thoughts, filtering the thoughts, observing the thoughts that are going to create more mental disturbance, not feeding to those thoughts. This is a very subtle sadhana. Huh? which, as I said, begins with uh, disciplines of, certain, uh, of other uh, uh, more gross, grosser aspects, which are very important to go to the discipline before we get to be able to discipline the mind. Why? Because if we don't have a, a mind like that, uh, the knowledge is going to remain more on the mental, intellectual, academic, informative uh, level. And then we don't uh, we don't uh, enjoy the fruits of this knowledge. Huh? And Swami Paramartananda goes to the extreme to say that it it can be even doubtless knowledge, self knowledge, doubtless. But if the mind is not uh, disciplined and prepared to to internalize or to allow those that knowledge to transform you, you have to do the hard work. Or the hard work is what. Discipline the mind, <laughs> filter those thoughts that are going to challenge your knowledge. You know, it's a very tough thing. Because you know? to get the knowledge, it's okay, we are all intelligent people. But then uh, conform my knowledge to my life, I need to be able to do the work of uh, disciplining my mind. Yeah? And uh, Swami Paramartananda in the Sixth chapter, uh, Gita, uh, Krishna, the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita uh, talks about that, and it was very good for me because uh, <clears throat> I was never giving much uh, credit, the, the deserving cred, credit, the credit that it deserves to all these disciplines of Upasana and uh, control this, control that, you know. But uh, it is a must, and so on. Paramartananda is going to explain it very clearly, nice, nicely in this in this elaboration here. In this, uh, in the previous verse, Gaudapada completes the Atyama Satya Anubhada topic, which is self knowledge. The pursuit of self knowledge was called a Spasta Yoga, which is synonymous of Yana Yoga. So in the previous verse, he was covering that. You know? uh, through Yana Yoga, one comes to self-knowledge, which is self-dependence, which is independence, which is moksha. You know? So Yana Yoga is moksha, and Yana Yoga uh, is basically uh, exposing one's mind and intellect to the teachings of Vedanta, and then further contemplation, the reflection, and then removal of doubts, vagueness, and abstraction. Uh, so this is the Vedantic process when it comes from uh, Kami Yoga, Upasana Yoga, and in Yana Yoga, you're going to get the knowledge. The knowledge is Upanishad knowledge, knowledge in respect to the discrimination between you yeah, your true self, your true Atma to hear, and uh, everything that has been superimposed upon you, which brought up this confusion. 
So this is uh, Yan Yoga, Shravana, Manana, and then uh, clearing all the doubts until you have this doubtless self-knowledge. And then we say, okay, now I'm good to go. Huh? And then Swami presents in this nice structure, he say, no, 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 you're not good to go. There is one last stage, which is Nididhyasana. So he's pointing to, to the fact, he's suggesting that Nididhyasana is the discipline of applying this knowledge at all times by being vigilant, disciplined, watching your mind when it starts thinking in contradiction to your self-knowledge. You, know? you have to be there. So one of the best, uh, my favorite uh, definitions of Nididhyasana, I think it comes from Dayananda, is application of self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> application against, against what? Against self-ignorance. Because all these thoughts that we need to filter, that, uh, that, that mind, mind is a bundle of thoughts. So those thoughts which are not in harmony with reality, I need to, to put them in their place, you know? I need to just, uh, I, I usually say like, uh, not nourish them, you know? And just uh, let them dry, filtering them, and say, no, 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 this is, I mean, there, is, there are other techniques. One of the Vedanta, Vedanta techniques, techniques proposed is to, to bring about the opposite thought. If you have a self-limiting thought, you just, uh, very negative thought, you just apply the positive thought right there. But you need to be in the, in the how you say, there is a very nice expression in English, in the, you have to be in the in that uh, it's a it's a modern expression of uh, of doing this job this work you know you have to be there it's very subtle and then you apply the opposite thought you know oh I'm being negative no now I apply a positive thought because it's the only thing I can do to to neutralize this negative thought no? things like that so he's saying that uh, the job does not end with shravana, manana, and uh, ha, and uh, doubtless self-knowledge, because uh, you need uh, nididhyasana. Now, nididhyasana is an, an integral part of yon yoga. Nididhyasana is the process by which we derive practical benefit from my doubtless self-knowledge. So that self-knowledge does not remain isolated as academic knowledge without bringing any benefit to my media life. No? So it's not enough to say I'm such, I'm such, I'm such, but um, if I'm all the time disturbed by media. So this I am such did not really me, free, freed me or fled me from the change of media. You know, some of this change are violent and dramatic. No? So we need to apply this knowledge so that we can enjoy the fruits of the doubtless self-knowledge, the benefit. Knowledge should not remain mere on the level of information, but it should come to transformation. Very nice play of words. Yeah? It is not information. It must be a transformation. Why? Because... You know, I have not only understood, but uh, it has transformed me. How so? I don't know. I know that uh, in the beginning, it was an intellectual understanding. It was clear. I had no doubt. But somehow I kept, I stayed with it. I stayed with it when I see uh, my life and my knowledge, they were aligned. You understand? Persistence, self-discipline. Nididhyasana, yeah? again and again, applying the knowledge, remembering the knowledge. <clears throat> and then Swami further uh, breaks it down for the benefit of all of us. I love this verse 40 here. He says like, uh, knowledge should bring about transformation of your state of mind. Knowledge, self-knowledge is not a state it's not a, an experience, it's not a mental state, but self-knowledge must bring 
a transformation in your mental state. Otherwise, it's just isolated as academic knowledge. Yeah? So it has somehow to grow. We see the three bodies to transform our overall uh, mental state. Yeah? Knowledge should bring about transformation of the state of mind. How does this take place? The quality of your life depends upon your predominant mental state. Huh? Predominant mental state. You see, it's not a fixed thing. It's an overall predominant state, the state of the Yani, who has been transformed by this intellectual self-knowledge. You understand? So the mind is properly resolved. The mind is just uh, holding on to its vision, the identical vision that there is only myself as conscious existence of limitless nature. There is nothing to be concerned here. All is good. Huh? So the mind is there. My mental state is, is good. It's just there. This is Sahaja Samadhi, by the way. It's the nature of Samadhi of a mind that has properly internalized this teaching in a way that predominantly it sees the world from the standpoint, I am such a, and this world is Nietzsche, a mere, a mere superimposition upon myself. But if the mental state is such that the person is always worried and depressed and anxious, feeling uh, bitter and irritable about the way people uh, treat or, or, or say things to you and so on, this bitterness most of the time. The mind is worry and uh, desire and complaining and fearing. If this is the predominant mental state, the quality of life will be poor and the person may have this knowledge. Right? You agree? Isn't it? Uh, Swami Ji is, is, brings it to such a simple terms for us to understand the whole process. So the quality of one's life will be poor in spite of my doubtless self-knowledge. So he's emphasized the importance of our mental state. Right? So I, I'm not here for changing my mental state. But at the same time, my mental state is what's going to indicate if this self-knowledge transformed my life or not. I'm not here for the mental state, I'm here for the knowledge. But once I have the knowledge, and then I say, now that I got the knowledge, I want the mental state. And my mental state is a byproduct of knowledge. Swamiji is saying it's not only a byproduct of knowledge, but it's also a byproduct of a discipline in the mind. Uh, you see how beautiful, how he builds it. So now that I have self-knowledge, I want to have a predominant mental state in which I see that the world is just Mitya and that this world cannot touch me. Uh, this is the transformation. This is the benefit. The mental state has to be transformed. And how are we going to get this mental state once I have a uh, doubtless of knowledge? By doing Nijidhyasana, application of knowledge, until all those bits and pieces of ignorance, they were, they were just destroyed, neutralized, in the light of what? Of my knowledge, of the scriptural knowledge that now is alive in my mind and it's allowing me to to disintegrate like a laser. Zzz, zzz, zzz. You go disintegrate all those bits and pieces of, you know, stupid thoughts. <clears throat> uh, this is called Jiva Mukti, and Krishna described that in the second chapter. And in several other chapters and verses, he presents several verses in which Krishna describes this mental, predominant mental state. How does one transform one's mental state? It's done by Mano Nigraha. 
which is changing or transforming the mental state and keeping with the Vedantic teaching. I need to learn how to see reality, né? keeping it with the Vedantic vision. This knowledge has to be my knowledge in the sense that I see and experience this world from the perspective of knowledge. I am Satya in this world is Mitya. I am Turiya. In keeping with Vedantic teaching, my mental state has to be harmonized, aligned, you know, in conformity, never in contradiction with Vedantic vision, Vedantic teaching. This is knowledge inspired mental state. How beautiful. This is Vedantic inspired mental state. Knowledge inspired mental state. You see this apparent reality, you know, from the perspective of this revealed knowledge. And why it feels good? Because now you are seeing things as they are, you are in harmony with the true nature of reality. If you are not in harmony with anything or anyone, you are not feeling comfortable. Try not to be in harmony with your partner or husband or wife. You are not comfortable. You need to harmonize. You need to harmonize with the vision of reality as declared by the Upanishads so that I understand it intellectually. And then I need to make it somehow cancel all the other mental activities which are in contradiction with knowledge because they are all what? They are ignorance-based vasanas that, you know, have been going from birth to birth as a stupid heritage, you know, given to us by this power, deceiving power of Maya. Transforming the mind, it's not at all easy. What determines the mental state? The mental state is determined by the thoughts that I am entertaining. No? We have to be so careful with our thoughts. Even after self-knowledge, even after uh, moksha. And moksha is not, it's not a, a black and white thing, you know? It's not, there's not a, a line that says, now I'm free. No. This is... Uh, Never end process, you know, of, no, I want to enjoy my moksha. I want to enjoy my true nature. So I don't accept thoughts that are going to contradict this uh, mental state or disturb my mental state. You start being concerned, even protect your mental state. If you go into certain environment in which your mental state is going to be negatively affect, you say, no, no, I prefer to stay with my chickens. Huh? <clears throat> so all of that is part of it, mental discipline. So you have to be vigilant in regards to what sorts you are entertaining. Sorts are running all the time. If sorts of complaints, bitterness, worry, hatred, per persecution, Occupy the mind predominantly, the mind cannot benefit from the doubtless self-knowledge. Handling the thoughts is called chitra vritti niroda. Handling the thoughts. Niroda is usually translated as stopping thoughts, mice, but in Vedanta, it's not about stopping thoughts. It's not a thoughtless state. It's just letting the mind sink in harmony with this revealed knowledge, uh, revealed inspired state. Thoughts, I need to learn how to discipline and re-educate re my mind, my thoughts. Uh, I want the thoughts to be, uh, he, he used the word directing, 
directing the thoughts or, or bring the harmonizing the thoughts with the thoughts I have learned from the Upanishads. Thoughts are of two types. Voluntary thoughts and involuntary thoughts. Involuntary thoughts are based on ignorant vasanas. So I'm I'm adding to you a little bit here. Why? Because uh, the the Vedantic thoughts, which takes enormous amount of energy to and effort to establish, they also are going to produce vasanas, but they are going to be knowledge based vasanas, scripturally scripture-based vasanas, those vasanas are necessary so that you don't need to be working on this uh, knowledge at all times. Your mind has been purified and now you have knowledge-based vasanas and that's where we say now that knowledge is good to go and it's work for me effortlessly. Otherwise, we need to be disciplined and head, educate the mind again and again, educate the mind again and again, educate the mind. At certain stage, the, the mind is such that every time there is a, a foreign thought, a, a, a self-ignorant thought, it, uh, it appears a little bit more like an elephant in your living room. <clears throat> it's, it's easily detect, detected and you say, oh, where you came from? Yeah? Residual ignorance. <clears throat> so he is going to talk a little bit about these involuntary thoughts, which are vasanas uh, thoughts that run in automatic. Which um, I'm already making a distinction. There are there are involuntary thoughts that are good to us, uh, which are knowledge based vasanas that are going to bring the thoughts again and again in regards to the true nature of reality. So that I'm protected even when I'm uh, you know I'm enjoy some entertainment because the thought is always there in the causal body. Uh. <clears throat> And voluntary thoughts are based on your vasanas. They arrive at the, on their own, choose to stay, decide whether they should allow you to do what you intend to do or not. So they became your master, those vasanas. Vasanas are past thoughts registered in the intellect. These vasanas alone come in the form of involuntary thoughts. I'm not entertaining deliberate thoughts all the time, so involuntary thoughts will come. Most of the time, thoughts are not invited. No, that's what I'm saying. It's impossible to control the mind to say, "No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the one." You have to get your pass here. No, any thought, no thought can appear here unless I approve. No, you cannot. Involuntary thoughts are there, so we need to see which involuntary thoughts are good which involuntary thoughts are just uh, okay, harmless, and which involuntary thoughts are really uh, damaging you know, or compromise my overall mental state. Huh? When I do not have discipline, the discipline again is very important at the beginning until we we cultivate and develop a lot of knowledge-based vasanas, and then we need more discipline. Once we have cultivated and established a very good uh, self-knowledge-based vasanas, not only on the intellectual conscious mind level, and then the discipline is not as much required. Okay? So... Thoughts, when I do not have discipline in the beginning of this process, the involuntary thoughts are taking over, and uh, more often than not, they, uh, they are just ignorant-based uh, involuntary thoughts. And they need to be stopped. They need to be prevented, entry. 
At the beginning, it's difficult. I tell them, no, do not come again. But they sneak in and we see they are there uh, running the show for you. And uh, to the degree that I identify with the thoughts and then I'm being taken for a ride, as we say. When those involuntary thoughts are in the form of habitual worry, bitterness, and so on, complaints, most of the time my mind is a samsari in a, in a samsari state, he says. You know? Your mind is subject to thoughts which uh, originate by ignorant based vasanas, and I'm not even aware of this process, this system. And uh, I have a samsari mind, so I'm living under the tyranny of ignorant vasanas that are going to produce a lot of unpleasant thoughts and emotions, which you will disturb and compromise my discriminating faculty. Uh, I, I, I begin losing too, this passion and Vivek, uh, everything. When I study Vedanta, if I have reasonable, good intellect, I will understand the teaching. But uh, the real problem is how to purify the mind because it requires a, a great effort to discipline it and to re-educate it. This passes by filtering or not entertaining involuntary thoughts that are contradictory, contradictory, contradictory to this knowledge, the vision of no reality, of no duality. So, for Vedanta to be beneficial, I should learn to manage my thoughts, my negative vasanas, involuntary thoughts. I came to a point of identifying them. The problem here is that most people do not even come to the point of identify those negative self-insult, self-limit, involuntary thoughts. Oh, no. No, I don't see any, any problem with my thoughts. I don't see any involuntary thoughts. I don't see anything. So how am I going to manage my involuntary thoughts that I, I don't even identify them? I don't see them. I don't recognize, I don't admit them. No, I'm on denial about my negative thoughts, involuntary negative thoughts. I just know that my mind is so disturbing and irritating. Me disturb, me irritable. No. no way, it's all good. It's my right to complain, it's my right to uh, this and that. Denial, 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 denial. So uh, the mind, in order to be managed and purified of these uh, thoughts, the first thing is to, to, to see them and to accept them. Let them rise. But for their continuation, they should have your permission. Every time an involuntary come, thought comes, you should say, okay, you came to this level. What level? A thought level. I see this thought and I have identified is as a problematic thought, which is going to produce a problematic state of mind. Painful. Let them rise at the level of thoughts. I never allow them to pass the level of thoughts to become words and deeds, and furthermore, I let them come just so that I can execute them with my Nijijasana. Mm -hmm. I should never allow myself, my higher intellect, to entertain these self-limiting involuntary negative thoughts. So they should never be entertained, and I do not give further permission for them to show up into my conscious mind. If you want to stay, stay there in the causal body, but I'm going to get you there as well, slowly, slowly. This knowledge is going to purify my conscious mind, and it's going to be feeding some knowledge-based vasanas, and my knowledge-based vasanas are going to consume your 
ignorance, this, the ignorance producing these negative thoughts. <clears throat> Many involuntary thoughts are not disturbing, but the disturbing ones will interfere with assimilation and internalization of self-knowledge. Many involuntary thoughts are not disturbing. I don't know if he's going to mention that uh, some involuntary thoughts, some involuntary vasanas may be very good and actually they are required so that you can enjoy self the fruits of self-knowledge without much effort later on <clears throat> management of involuntary thoughts is absolutely important sadhana astanga yoga is designed for this management trying to keep the mind focused and away from these negative, self-limiting, self-offensive, self-insulting, self-disturbing thoughts is an important spiritual discipline. At the time of Upasana Yoga, this discipline should be practiced. We need to really look at those thoughts and uh, apply the knowledge during our pasana. This discipline should be practiced. Vedanta minus this yogic discipline would give only academic knowledge or academic information. Most of us try to get yan before we purify the yog, the mind by the means of yoga to bring about a good mental state, a good sattvic mental state, contemplative state. Uh, most of us, yeah, we want to get the knowledge, the Shravan Manan, before we have a prepared mind, before we do yoga. And even if we become yanis, getting uh, doubtless self-knowledge, we do not derive the full benefit of this knowledge. So what is the bottom line here? This yoga of disciplining and purifying the mind is required all through. During Kami Yoga, no? during Upasana Yoga, and in most cases, during and after, during Nididhyasana, which is the best and more direct way to, to uh, <coughs> deny entry and uh, Purify the mind, no? the, the deny entry of these ignorant, ba ignorantly based thoughts. Even if we become yanis, uh, we will not derive the full benefit, meaning to say, so you need to do that even after the self knowledge is a doubtless self knowledge if we want to enjoy moksha, which is the full benefit or the benefit in general, the overall benefit, shanti, peace, stability, samatvam, uh, dispassion. In that case, one should learn to manage the involuntary thoughts after self-knowledge, start monitoring the mind. Anytime an inappropriate thought comes, let it come. Once it comes, note it. And then don't deny, don't say what sort. Once it comes, notes it and decide if you should allow it to continue or not. If you tell the mind that that sort should go away, that sort should go away. Total clarity no? in respect to what sort to entertain. This topic of uh, discipline Na Emano Nigraha, Nigraha and Nididhyasana Yoga is introduced from the verse 40 to 48. So the, the next several uh, eight verses are going to be unfolding more and more of this wonderful topic of uh, self discipline. It's very interesting. We are here doing Mandukya, and uh, on this chapter six, we are entering the same topic.
Galdapada says that all the spiritual seekers should practice this yoga of learning to handle these involuntary negative thoughts. It's called manatsa nigraha. Only when the mind is disciplined, uh, stable, equanimity, the following practical benefits of uh, jiva mukti will be gained, obtained. Abhyam, being fearless, as the verse, the previous verse, or this verse were saying, being fearless, less anxious regarding the future. Do come, yeah? happiness, satisfaction, end of complaints, varieties of grief and despondence, akyashanti, lasting peace, and proboda, unobstructed knowledge. So, Aparoksha Yanan, non obstruct by what? By ignorance based knowledge that are going to be there, you know, obstructing the enjoyment or the fruits of self knowledge. So, you want an Aparoksha Yanan, unobstruct knowledge. After Yanan, Jiva Mukti depends on what? On this yoga of purification, of discipline, which is handling all these negative uh, thoughts, thoughts which are based on the ignorance of the true nature of reality. Hmm? What do you guys think? It reminds go ahead, me. Lynn. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. It reminds me of when I was uh, working as a, a director of this program at the university for teenagers who otherwise wouldn't have been uh, exposed to college life, and to come and to, you know, have their motivations fulfilled, etc. And working with thirty teenagers, it's just like working with your thoughts, you know. You just have to take charge. And the wonderful thing is that they they all fall in line because of the goodwill. And so it's they understand, you know. And I think you're uh, you understand too that this is all for benefit. Discipline is discipline is my go-to. <laughs> I love disciplined life. It's just become really important to me. It's, so it's a very nice. I remember you saying some time ago, Arlinda, about Papaji's talking about eternal vigilance. Yeah. And uh, this this reminded me of that. It just takes yeah. that eternal vigilance. Yeah. As I often say, uh, vigilance is uh, is required. Uh, all the time, uh, very intensively at the beginning, and less and less, and more and more effortless later on. But it's always good to, to stay vigilant and to stay associated to the, to the scripture, or to the gurus. In this final part of the Sur Shapta Gaudapada Chari, dealing with a very important discipline, which is called the, the Mano Nigraha which had a different name in Tattva Bodha. This mental discipline or thought discipline is extremely important. At Kama Yoga level, this discipline is already required. So it's saying that in Kama Yoga, so you have to be careful and be vigilant uh, in regards to the thoughts because uh, as a Kama Yogi, you are learning this uh, Ishwara knowledge, this Mitya knowledge, huh? and you are learning to, to, to connect the dots between your, your actions, your thoughts, words, and actions, and the results. And uh, at that level, you need to, to understand the, the Vasana and then uh, the thoughts, words, and deeds uh, system. And 
as a kami yogi, you have to be already uh, working on the disciplines of this ignorant, ignorant based thoughts, you know. So he says that kami lega, it is required mental discipline because you are learning to to receive whatsoever comes as opportunity, as prasada, and then uh, regardless now whether it is. Uh, meeting your expectations and desire, but uh, when you put your, your actions, you have to put from the angle of discrimination as well. You discriminate between what is proper, which is Dharma, uh, and what is a Dharma. And uh, you have to watch because your involuntary mind is going to be uh, tending to, to, to do things based on one's likes and dislikes, and you have to discriminate. All the time, we're going to be watching the, the mind and their thoughts and its thoughts. The mental disciplines or thought discipline is extremely important at the level of Kama Yoga. And at the, at the, at the level of Upasana Yoga, is, is, it is needed. It is almost like compulsory because you are there only for that. When you go into personal yoga, you, you are going there. You don't need to act. You don't need to interact. You don't need to, to, to discipline, them, uh, to, to discriminate between Dharma and Dharma and such and media. You are there just to watch your mind, watch your thoughts. And, uh, and you need to be prepared for that. Yeah? Extremely important at the level of uh, Kami Yoga and absolutely compulsory at the level of Upasana. Otherwise, Upasana itself is not even possible. You know? Because uh, you can you can be a Kami Yogi without having much discipline of mind. You're just going to put uh, present a lot of actions which are not really in conformity with uh, the Shwara knowledge. But you, at least you're going to take the results as prasada. You're going to go through some pain. Remember that pain is good. It's an indication that I need to, to understand better what I'm saying and doing. So by at the level of a person, you are there just to make sure that your mind is thinking in harmony with your wisdom now, no? this spiritual wisdom. Otherwise, there is no chance of doing upasana. Shravana and manana can take place only if you have gone through upasana at that point, you know. Shravana and manana can take place only when the mind of the student is pure and available for the teachings. Yeah? Ultimately, even after gaining knowledge, if the knowledge is to be available on the practical level, which is Jiva Mukti. Mental discipline is absolutely necessary. It's learning to handle involuntary thoughts that the mind is generated continuously. And then he says something that, uh, that I like. I have been saying that to illustrate lately doing the Gita, chapter six on, on Upasana. I brought this, yeah. I brought this up. I say, so you want to know what is an involuntary mind? Just watch your dreams. You have no control of the dreams. No? You wake up and say, oh my God, so why these thoughts were popping up and producing this dream world? You know. And here he, he says as well about that. Except during the short period of time of deep sleep, the mind is continuous generate involuntary thoughts. If you if you if you doubt it, if you don't believe me, just watch your dreams. <laughs> huh? These involuntary thoughts are the two, are two type, the harmful ones, and uh, and the not harmful. And I don't know, I don't remember if he's going to address the. What is the opposite of harmful? Well, you could say benef beneficial or harmless. Beneficial, yeah, beneficial. Thank you. So the, there are different kinds of thoughts, involuntary thoughts. Some of them are, are harmful, others are harmless, and others are beneficial. Right? But we're going to leave it all for our next class.
uh, next Monday, yeah? this Friday we meet for the for the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, let's go and uh, get ready for lunch here. I don't know there. That's too early for Lynn, too late for Mark. Okie dokie. Oh, Thank you. We meet again soon. Sure, we Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.